we bought the house in 1990, which seems like a hundred years ago, but we had been uh, in the Tuscan countryside five years before that. We rented a house near Cortona by chance with a group of, with several writer friends. And it, this was long before the internet, of course. So the New York Review of Books on the back page had and still has houses for rent. It's mostly was then professors leasing their houses to people with sabbaticals. So I found this house. I didn't know Cortona from Borscht. So we rented this house and we were there for a month. And first day we were there, I put my little basil plants in the ground. By the end of the time we were there, those plants had grown that much. Anytime you garden in Tuscany, it's amazing because the soil is so, so rich. But I felt like, you know, those little plants had put down their roots and maybe I had too. So after that, we rented houses in different parts of Tuscany. We were enamored of Tuscany. I think because it was what we knew the best because of the Renaissance art. So we rented houses and, and looked and looked and looked. There are stories of that in Under the Tuscan Sun. But um, when we pulled up in front of Bramasole with the agent, I got out of the house and looked up and said, this is my house. This is where, this is where I want to live. And of course I hadn't seen what a wreck it was inside, but it was just one of those uh, metabolic connections with the place because the house is situated on the side of a hill where there's an Etruscan wall at the top and down in the valley below is where Hannibal defeated the Romans 217 BC. So it's really situated there in time. And that just appealed to me very much that the place itself where it looked out and what I would see. I looked up at the house and I said, I already know that room up there is my study. And it has been an inspiring place to, very inspiring place to write. I do feel a continuing presence with the people who lived there before me. We just in the past two years have been doing a further renovation and in taking down uh, a bowed plaster wall, we found more frescoes. And when you see something like that, you can't help but feel connected with the person who did it. These frescoes were in a bedroom and they were just frescoes of draperies all around the room. So the bed was in there and it was, you know, the trompe l'oeil of being surrounded by draperies and they're beautiful swags and coral colored. And we just realized the house still has these, um, these secrets to offer up and they are all connected with people who lived there previously. Mostly I find little things in the garden, digging up, trying to plant things. I find little bits of pottery. I have a collection. There must be a hundred different kinds of little pieces of color, different colored ceramics. And I've said to Ed, I think some of the women who lived here must have been really angry because they've thrown out all these dishes out the door. But that, that's the thing with old houses. I've always been enchanted with uh, old houses because of that sense of continuity. The first, uh, the first major surprise was the fresco we found in the dining room because it replicates the view of the lake that you can see from various parts of our land. So that uh, art historians have told me that that fresco is, um, contemporary with the origin of the house, which was in the 1700s. So that was kind of mind blowing to me that I was washing down the walls just to repaint them. And this fresco started to emerge. And it was just, I thought it was a miracle. Since then I found out like, anytime you scrub down a house in Cortona, you find some fresco. It was just such a style in, in 
in these houses. Um, it, they are everywhere. And you know, some go up into the 1900s there. We found stencil parts of rooms. So that kind of discovery was great. And then when we were redoing the floor in one room, taking up the floor because it, water was coming in, we found this big square stone and it had a cross engraved in it and you know the Christian IHS carved in it. That was just amazing too, because we thought maybe there might have been a chapel in that place at one time. So those secrets are those secrets are inspiring. We started being enchanted by the cuisine. And that was partly uh, through the men who were working there and they were bringing us things from home. And they educated us about olive oil. And in town, we were trying all the restaurants and we had a very rudimentary kitchen, but I started writing immediately about food and studying the food, studying the, the roots of a very innovative cuisine. The roots are poor roots, the cucina povera, the poor kitchen. So, you know, they cooked with what they had. And I think that was, that's what fostered, I think one of the most innovative cuisines in the world. Um, they may do with the things they gathered, the foraging, the wild chestnuts, the nettles, the wild asparagus, you know, they used what they had. And I was fascinated by the food because I had cooked French food. I cooked my way through Julie Child. I was enamored of French food. And then I got there, started meeting people, food people and neighbors and friends who didn't even own cookbooks but they made fabulous food. So it was a real awakening like, oh, it's the ingredients, you know, it's primo ingredients. And so I, I've always written a lot about food. I had done some uh, food articles in the past for Food and Wine Magazine and Gourmet Magazine and, uh, and the New York Times. And the New York Times asked me to write an article about shoes, Italian shoes. And I wrote that article, it was fun to write. And as I wrote the article, I, I thought, well, this is actually an essay. And all these other things I've been writing, they could be essays too. So it just kind of grew out of that, you know, seeing this article about the shoes. And then they asked me to write another article about the local Saturday market. And I wrote that article. That was really what galvanized it, writing about the place of the weekly market in the lives of the Italians. Because every town still has their market and you go there every week and you meet people and you get recipes and you see the artichokes that are just up from Sicily and that whole feeling around food around there is so vibrant. I think most of the Italians talk about food like 90% of the time. You know? And uh, when, when did you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying those, those two articles really set me on a structure. That, so the book is not a continuous narrative, actually. It's a series of essays. At the bottom of our driveway, we have a Madonnina, a shrine with a, a ceramic Madonna in it. I'm not even religious, but I keep my shrine because uh, people walk by there constantly, you know, crossing themselves. And in Under the Tuscan Sun, a man used to come every day and leave flowers in the shrine. And he would pick them on his way, on his walk. He took that walk every day. He left the flowers in the shrine. The next day, he came with a new little bouquet, throw the other one out. That went on for years. And that was before, uh, before my book came out. So he eventually disappeared. I, I guess he died. My husband says he moved to the coast, but I think he probably died. 
But by that time, my books had been, my Under the Tuscan Sun, and then after that, other books, people began to leave gifts in the shrine. And as the books became published in different countries, and people started walking by the house to see the house the book was about. They leave things in the shrine. They leave coins from their country. They leave little flags. They leave little dolls. They leave notes. I have boxes of notes that people have left. So I've been just, you know, really lucky to be a, a, a recipient of these kinds of, of gifts, the gifts of of people who, who come there because they're on that quest that I talked to you about. I think anyone who comes um, to see a place because of a book or a film, you know, it's a, it's a connection they felt with something that was important. So I'm flattered that that happens to me. People always say, it doesn't drive you crazy people coming by your house all the time, but it doesn't. It's uh, it seems it means something else to me. I mean, I read that Peter Mayo when he wrote A Year in Provence, he eventually left that house because people were driving him crazy. And I think somebody jumped in his swimming pool or something. But I said to Ed, I think the people who come to our house must be nicer than the people who came to his because they have been just lovely. And it's been, it's been a pleasure to meet people from all over the world who, who've read a book 